You are now about to witness the strength of street knowledge. Everybody, blessings, blessings to you. It is your diva in knowledge, Lady Mocha, representing Mocha's Ladies Lounge, Unhinged Series number eight. No, it's been a while. I know my daughter's just come in town, so you know um, I've been spending time with her. But nevertheless, um, I wanted to get into this right away because again. This is long overdue, so y'all know I'm late, but I'm always on time. So nevertheless, um, for those of you who have been not able to keep up with the community tab, I posted that I was going to do an unhinged series on obsessed side piece, unalived rapper's baby, mother, and abducts the baby for years. Now, this is a very, very intriguing story, might I add. Um, even though it's been many, many years ago, um, this story is still, it seems as if it happened like yesterday, you know. But um, keep in mind, this was during one of those times in which it wasn't as common as it is today. You know, we're all the time hearing about um, either baby daddies unaliving the baby mamas or the side chick unaliving the baby mamas or the 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 uh the side the the um baby the baby daddy's new woman is unlocked by the baby mama you know we hear these type of stories all the time but um nevertheless it wasn't that common during this time which was back in 1995 you didn't hear these type of stories and of course we didn't have social media we didn't have youtube we didn't have twitter we didn't have all these social media devices that kept us in the loop and consistently advertised, I mean, advertised in, um, brought a lot of media awareness to these type of things that would occur back then. But nevertheless, y'all, this story goes back to 1995. What the hell was I doing in 1995? I think I was 15, 16, maybe, in middle school. But nevertheless, there's a rapper um, during that time and era who was really popular on the West Coast and Vallejo, California at the time by the name of Lathan Williams, but everybody knew him by his stage name, which was Young Lay. And he was a San Francisco Bay Area based gangster rapper, you know, kind of like, um, like Snoop Dogg, Dog Pound, like Dr. Dre, kind of somewhere in that alignment. And for those of you who, you know, are curious as to what type of genre of music um, he used to do. So um, at that time, Young Lay was a hot, uh, a hot upcoming artist. Um, he was under the same label um, with other rappers such as Ray Love, Tupac Shakir, and Mac Dre, which was also very hot West Coast rappers at that time. So if you're not from the West Coast, you're probably not going to be too familiar with half of any of these names or if you're not in the West Coast rap. Um, Ice Cube is another one. Easy E, all of that or whatever. So, um, NWA. Yeah. So, Young Lay was becoming popular in 1995. And again, he was signed to a local rap label and started his rap career um, actually in 1992. So, he actually started his career in 92, but he didn't get signed to a label until 95. So, Young Lady had then dropped his first single, All About My Fatty, which I think is still pretty banging. You know what I mean? Check it out. It is on YouTube. Um, those of you who are familiar with the movie, New Jersey Drive, the song was actually featured on that movie, and I love that movie. It is a classic, New Jersey Drive. But anyway, you will hear his 
single in the background called All About My Fetty. Young Lay's success was climbing to the top rapidly. Rapidly. Um, he was pretty much, you know, climbing the charts. But it would also lead to some unfortunate um, change of events that would not only change his success, but would forever change his life. So, um, the first situation was, um, young lady was driving on the passenger side of his friend's ride in 1995. You know how dudes like to ride together in the same whip. And he was shot in the head twice at a traffic light by a car that just so happened came up on him. So, it was definitely planned. They just caught him at the right place at the wrong time. But uh, he was shot in the head twice, y'all. And nevertheless, just goes to show you, there's nothing that God cannot do. Only God really gets to decide when it's your time to go or not. So nevertheless, God had other plans and young lady survived and went through an extensive uh, process of therapy, y'all. He, he was mildly brain damaged in which he had to learn how to walk and talk again so you could only imagine how um detrimental this life event was for him you know um being able to survive two bullets um that basically pierced through his head and he still lived to tell the story when i say god is awesome y'all the god definitely had a calling on this man's life but um uh, after he got through that which you can only imagine was a very long process and i'm still even after he healed he still struggled you because you never become a hundred percent the same after experiencing that type of trauma but let's get right back to the story so just when you thought matters could not get any worse young lay had discovered he would be a father uh and girlfriend soon to be mother uh, of his child 70 year old daphne boyden so basically daphne boyden um was expecting young lay's first child so you could imagine that um this was pretty much an exciting moment um for young lay and for daphne um, knowing that they were entering in, into a new chapter in their lives in which that which they were actually going to become parents for the very first time. So um, young Lay's infant son, Lejean Williams, was born. So keep in mind, Daphne was living with her grandmother. Um, I would say, I know the woman's name. I know I wrote all of this down, y'all. Um, Reva Lee Boyden. Um, which was the grandmother of young Lay's baby's mom, Daphne. So Daphne was living with her grandmother, uh, Mrs. Boyden, at the time. Now, keep in mind, Vallejo, California uh, is a relatively large city, but at the same time, everybody pretty much knew each other. It was it was a small it was a small area, also, especially um, for anybody who was able to gain any type of relevance or any type of celebrity status which at this point young lady did adopt celebrity status so by him becoming popular of course the mother of his child became popular as well everybody knew young lady and everybody who knew young lady they knew that daphne boyden uh was expecting a child from young lady now keep in mind being that young lady was new in the game you know of course he had groupies he had been dealing with female fans. You know how it goes when these men get in this type of profession, um, this type of career. <laughs> Very rarely, you know, do they stay faithful? Do they stay loyal? Because um, there's a lot of temptation. And women just love, you know, um, targeting these type of men. And today that has not changed. The only difference is back then there was no cameras on phones where females could actually blackmail dudes and expose them but it has always you know groupies have always existed um especially when it came to the rap game or, or the industry and that, that just comes with the territory so as you can imagine young lady 
being not only a successful upcoming rapper, um, also, uh, I would say, uh, also an attractive guy, you know, at that time, you know, of course he was going to have a lot of women, um, basically present an offer to him, you know, multiple occasions. So, um, nevertheless, what ended up happening was, um, young lay, you know, against his better judgment, ended up getting involved with one of these females who, in to who, um, unfortunately, um, ended up becoming the demise of his child's mother and we'll, we'll go more into that story as um, I continue to narrate the incident that actually took place so what ended up happening was um, Daphne had just had Lejean, Lay's first born only son and a lot of people knew like I said a lot of people knew Lay from around the way and they knew Daphne. So from time to time, um young Lay's fans would approach or encounter Daphne. And of course, Daphne being the mother of his child, of course, you know, she supported his fans who supported him. So she did have people, you know, fans of him who fans of young Lay's who would stop by, visit pay their respects, show love, and keep in mind back then, you know, uh, times were different. Can't do that now, of course, I'm sure. Any woman in this day and age, even if her husband is, is famous or her baby daddy is successful, you can't just go knocking up on her door today. Oh, I would like to see, you know, um, Drake's son. Or I would like to see, you know, um, little baby's son that y'all or daughter y'all just had together. Or little Wayne. So, you know, you can't do that in this day and age. And I definitely wouldn't recommend it. But back then, again, you got to look at the times back then. Before we become judgmental and knock how everybody handled this situation it was a different time and different era i want everybody to keep that in mind as i am you know um discussing this story and what took place so daphne had several people would stop by to show love and visit her so nevertheless on this particular day um Daphne was up and about you know feeding her son you know who was only two weeks old at the time and of course by her living with her grandmother her grandmother did her usual going to bingo thing that was her little hobby her grandmother loved to go to her little bingo so as she was getting dressed and going to head out there is this mysterious knock at the door there's this knock at the door and um mrs boyden daphne's grandmother opens the door and here it is these two young black females you know seem cool seem um you know friendly and they basically told the grandmother that they were there to visit daphne so her not thinking much of it being that they pretty much look the same age and the fact that young lady was popular and daphne did have friends you know the grandmother didn't think not much of nothing of it so Daphne was entering in the living room as the grandmother had just welcomed them in because they basically said, hey, we're here to see Daphne. We heard she had the baby and, you know, we just wanted to see young Lay's child and, you know, and the grandmother being friendly and easygoing, she let them in and Daphne al allowed them to come in as well. Daphne didn't debunk it and say, Grandma, I don't know these chicks like that. Uh-uh, I'm not comfortable. You know, everything seemed cool, calm, and collective. So, as the two girls, you know, are, 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 are sitting there and acting so friendly and acting like they're there um, because they're so interested in young, young Lay's um, newborn infant son, the grandmother says to her granddaughter Daphne, she said, look, I'm going to go play bingo i'll be back in a couple hours start dinner blah 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 and that was that the grandmother left so when the grandmother left it was just daphne and these two young women so needless to say to this day the 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 uh the the details are very vague as to what they actually did to daphne 
But one thing we do know is that whatever act took place, whatever physical act that occurred that unfaithful day, Daphne lost her life. And not only did these two hood rats torment this woman who was friendly enough to allow them into her and her grandmother's home around her son whom she just had um it backfired it backfired because these two females were not there for the right reasons um they already had grimy intentions and all of that will continue to unfold as i finish telling you the rest of this story so to add insult to injury they had already physically assaulted this girl um causing her um to lose her life they took the baby took lejean who again was only two weeks old from this woman who they just unalived and when they left the residents leaving this woman alone, lifeless, without her son, they also took it upon themselves to set the house on fire. So physically assaulting this woman was not enough. They had to take it to another level where they actually set the home on fire so basically they was determined and uh they set the home on fire in attempt to cover up the crime that's what they thought they were doing and um needless to say it that that backfired on them as well but this is what ended up happening. Um, the grandmother, but no one's to her, pulling up on the pulling up um, on the street, totally discombobulated, seeing her house on fire. So imagine you're just going to run some errands, going to play some bingo, or you leave your granddaughter and your great grandson. I haven't even been going a good hour just to come back and see your house on fire. So, like any other caring grandmother would do, the first thing Miss Boyden thought about was her granddaughter and her great grandson. Seeing her house on flames, her major concern was them because, from what she could remember, they were the last ones there. So, she tried to barge through the police because of course she's panicking she's freaking out she's wanting to know what's going on my granddaughter and my great grandson is in there i got to see them or i got to get them out of there of course police would not let her through one because of her safety they didn't want her getting hurt and two that's going to tamper with the evidence they don't need nobody else coming in on the scene especially when something this heinous has occurred so um once it was brought to her attention and they put the fire out and you, as you can imagine the whole neighborhood everybody's standing around surrounding um daphne's grandmother's house because again a lot of people know that um these individuals are associated the young lady they know that's rappers young ladies baby mama's grandmama's house they know that. So all of the neighbors are standing outside. Everybody's trying to figure out what's going on. They see this house in flames and things of that nature. And of course, they had to hit her with the unfortunate news that um, her granddaughter had died and that her grandson had been, great grandson had been abducted. So the grandmother, of course, was very distraught, um, very confused. And 
you know, anybody in our situation would totally just be um, devastated. And she was totally devastated. So, nevertheless, you know, they had to ask her questions, you know, um, um, things pertaining to what could have possibly um, caused the death of Daphne Boyd. And the only thing that the grandmother was able to basically tell them was, um, you know, the last time I left, you know, I left these two young ladies with my granddaughter. I mean, with my, I keep calling them girl. With my, um, yeah, I said it right the first time. With my granddaughter. And they came to visit her so they could see my great-grandson. That was the last of everything that I could remember before I left. So, um, as the story continues to get interesting, of course, you know, young lady is notified of this. Um, everybody's upset because not only, again, is Daphne um, Boyd deceased, the mother of Lejean, Lejean is missing. So, we got two different issues at stake. The mother is physically gone the, the, the mother is physically gone and the infant son he's missing he's nowhere in the fire they didn't see no evidence of him anywhere in the home so um it, it's, it's pretty much clear at this point someone abdu abducted Lejean. so this stirred up a lot of hostility and anger without the whole within the whole community because for one at this point in time nobody's not thinking that a female had anything to do with this they think this was a ruthless act something um foul play that done went down you know because again Daphne didn't have no reputation of being a troublesome girl or um she didn't have beef or hostility with people as far as everyone knew so um basically th this caused an outrage people was protesting um for not only for the justice of daphne boyd but for um um the issue of the baby being missing so um, the whole neighborhood basically was advocating for um, Lejean's return back to his grandmother. You know, it's bad enough he already lost his mother. The whole family is concerned about who has Lejean. Where is he? Is he hurt? Who took him? All of this on top of still having to attend the funeral. Having a plan the funeral of the mother so could y'all actually imagine going through something like this as the grandmother you still got to bury your granddaughter and still don't know where your great grandson is who has him and the world is so evil no different now than back then you could be looking at the enemy who's right there at your granddaughter's funeral who, who probably has your grandson great grandson in their possession and they're sitting up there showing all this empathy and sympathy. And, and, and they are the ones behind it. Because, you know, uh, people are evil. Evil has never gone out of style. They was evil then and they're evil now. It's just that it's more, ob it's more ob obvious because um, social media puts everything out there. So while all of this is going on. The story gets reported to Unsolved Mysteries. Unsolved Mysteries back then, uh, during the early 90s, was one of the most popular shows um, that basically showcased crimes in which, um, that crimes that was pretty much very heinous, um, that resulted in the loss of lives and the fact that, um, you have police who could not resolve these crimes without public information and public participation. Um, 
the snitch code was not as strong as it is today. People can see your house getting broken into. People can see your child getting harmed or endangered, and people won't say a word. Um, back then, people was a little bit more concerned for their neighbor's well-being, more concerned for loved ones getting justice. Some still are today, but not a whole lot. So, the story is showcased on Unsolved Mysteries, and I will leave the link um, to the bottom of this video so you can check it out yourself. And Young Lay is actually being interviewed by, uh, I guess, whoever the host is, whoever's the host of the show. And basically, he explains his side of the story because at first they tried to say that him being shot in the head twice, they felt like 10 minutes, 10 months later since um, the situation happened with his baby mama that it was somehow some way related. But he did make it very clear and it ended up being cleared after the investigators looked more into it that he knew it was a separate issue because uh, when they wanted him, they specifically came for him. They would not go for the baby mama. Well, that was the narrative back then. But, you know, these days, they'll even go for the baby mamas. You know, um, look at Young Thug. They unalived his baby mama. And they had an issue with him or whatever. Allegedly. We don't know. Uh, by the way, let me put my disclaimer. Everything I see in this video is alleged and based off my own opinion. And it's for educational and um, entertainment purposes only. So, that was ruled out. Because the incidents happened within the same year. Um, there was this assumption that um, they both had something to do with each other. But that's been clear. No, that was not the case. Um, so, moving right along. We still have this newborn that cannot be found. That's been missing. Uh, he basically was taken now different sources are saying two weeks the others are saying four weeks but nevertheless he was an infant he turned up six years later they found him six years later and you would not believe who had this baby for six years in their possession. The two young ladies that was involved in this whole unfortunate situation, unnecessary. One of the young ladies' name was Latasha Brown who was 22 years old at the time. And she was not in it by herself. She also had her cousin with her, Oceanetta Williams, who was also in on the whole incident that took place. And she was right there with Latasha Brown assisting her. Now, keep in mind, um, me get um I want to get Oceanetta Williams age too so um that way we have a, 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 a full understanding of the story now keep in mind Oceanetta was 23 so I was able to confirm the ages of Latasha Brown 22 and Oceanetta 23 um so yeah the, 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 they were already they were young put it this way both of them was under the age of 25 so all of this time imagine Lejean this newborn who was missing for 6 years was actually being raised literally right around the corner he just a few miles from where his mother was shot and her body burned to death. And he was living practically right around the corner. And a sad part to this, y'all, is um, the details are so gruesome 
you know, and um, I'm going to go into just piecing together the details just a little bit more because I want y'all to really get in depth to how messed up this thing really was. But um, going back to this news article right quick, I want to hit up this article because it explains something I thought that was pretty interesting. So, okay, let me correct those dates, y'all. Natasha Brown was 25, okay? And um, her second cousin, Oceanetta Williams, was 23, okay? So, let, I needed to re-clarify that. All right, so all of this happened on May, May 17th, 1996, at the boarding home that she shared with her grandmother. Um, now, after the shooting... Brown set the house on fire and fled to Texas where she stayed with relatives and obtained a false birth certificate. So, family was aware of this. Her aunt um, was a nurse who worked at a health department in which she had access to birth certificates. So, the aunt helped to create a false birth certificate and uh, Latasha Brown's mother knew that the baby did not belong to her daughter Latasha as well. However, she too supported Latasha in raising this child. She knew all this time Latasha was having issues um, conceiving and having a baby. And any mother who had any type of integrity or morals, if your ch if your daughter comes home with a newborn baby um you're not going to ask any questions and she just decides to take care of this baby you're not going to ask her where this baby came from you're not going to ask her who's the mother to this child you just willingly just welcomed um taking this baby in knowing it doesn't belong to you or your daughter but that's what happened um brown against her better judgment Return to, Valle uh, return to Vallejo after a few months. But uh, she was not arrested till six years later. Okay. And that was um, when police received an anonymous tip. So that's what ended up happening with that. Now um, the next part that I found. Uh, what, that I thought was interesting. Um, the, how the doctors said that. Um, see if I can find it. That. Um. Latasha Brown was suffering from some type of disease and we're going to go into that because um, the dynamics of this type of disease I thought was really really like interesting and um, I wanted to share this with y'all a lot of these articles they be slick they be want you to pay to read old stories and when they could just publicize them for free okay so anyway during the trial the doctors had testified okay yeah my mic check okay the doctors testified at the trial that brown may have been suffering from a rare condition called let me make sure i pronounce this correctly say you do Sa I'ma um see if I'm a I'm a um I'ma type that word <laughs> in the um comment section, y'all. But from what I can from how I can pronounce it is is um Sayudosis or an imaginary pregnancy. And that's the term I'm going to keep up with because I'm hooked on phonics. I cannot read even after two master's degrees. So we're going to keep it kindergarten style. Um, she was suffering from a rare condition of imaginary pregnancy. I had mistakenly thought she was in labor three weeks before the murder. Prosecutors claimed that Brown, who had a relationship with Williams, was jealous of the rap artist's relationships with Boyden. So again this was a groupie okay who wanted to be with lay and could not be with lay because uh she wasn't able to conceive from lay 
So she took matters upon her hand out of a jealous rage um, to unalive Daphne and take Daphne and Lay's son. She supposedly called herself Brown, writing a statement she made to police and letter to God, found in jail in 2002. And they basically tried to state uh, that letter should not have been allowed as evidence in her trial. You know, I guess they were reaching at this point, trying to find anything to try to get off. But um, court didn't do much with it. Uh, that 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 letter did not decide her fate because the letter did not um, contain any clear admission of guilt. The panel said there was overwhelming independent evidence of guilt. In other words. They already had everything they needed. So her trying to use that, they were trying to use a letter she wrote in prison. I, I didn't cut it. They had enough of evidence. So what happened was um, the second cousin, Oceanetta Williams, um, who was with Brown at the time of the murderer, became a, prosecu a prosecution witness. And basically she snitched on her cousin, ratted her out because she went through all that time. She was given 13 years as part of the plea agreement. And um, Natasha Brown was given 25 years to life. So, just to kind of recap to give some more information to this, um, we already knew that uh, um, Natasha and her cousin was welcomed into the home. And um, to give a little bit of background on this, uh, with with the with Mrs. Brown. In early 96, Brown, who was 15 years old, who was living with her mother, Dolores Brown, in California, Vallejo, at the time, um, she told her mom that she was pregnant and that the baby was due in May or June. Her mother took to her one, took her to one prenatal visit, and basically, the mother believed, because she looked pregnant, um, that she was. And um, her mother actually threw her a baby shower. Nevertheless, April 27, 96, Brown arrived at the hospital indicating she was in labor. Her mother brought a copy of an ultrasound with her. Though the name of the patient and the facility where the test was performed had been re redacted, the nurse examined Brown and concluded that she was not pregnant. Dr. Daniel Oliver performed an ultrasound and came to the same conclusion. And he also testified that her body shape was consistent with pregnancy. In other words, she was already big and heavy. So, one would believe that she was pregnant. He told Brown, her mother, that Brown was not pregnant, though. Brown asked, where did it go? She cried her ass who took my baby. So, basically, this chick really believed that she was pregnant. And her mother was very devastated as well. They could not understand. And basically... Brown really psyched herself up into believing that she was pregnant. She wanted to be pregnant just that bad. So she made herself believe that. And that is when the doctor had said they had diagnosed her with having a condition of that word that I'm not even going to butcher. And dis dis disrespect that, um, that, that um, um, medical term. So I'm going to just call it imaginary pregnancy in which a woman presents herself as pregnant when she is not. And basically that was what the psychologist was stating. Um, that she really made herself believe that she was pregnant. She wanted a baby just that much y'all. And I know this seems irrelevant but this is important information to make y'all realize what made this woman. What led her to take it all the way up until this point. To give you an understanding of her desperation, how strongly desperation and aggravation have really set in for Miss Brown, who really wanted this baby. Um, so I already gave y'all a story. I'm not repeating that. When Rival left, left the two girls alone with Daphne so she could play bingo. Um, Oceanetta Williams, the cousin. Um, she testified during the plea agreement. Brown told her that she was pregnant. And Rico Sandifer was the father. May 17, 96, Brown told her she wanted to visit Daphne, whom Williams did not know. Oceanetta didn't know her. And that she wanted to see her baby. 
So about a week before the unalived incidents took place, Brown had told Williams, I'm going to unalive Daphne, take the baby, and burn the house down. So this is Oceanetta, her cousin, testifying everything that Brown told her. Oceanetta did not believe her at the time. However, Brown said nothing to Williams about the shooting uh, uh, of um, Daphne on May 17, 96. So Brown and Williams walked to Daphne's house where Daphne's grandmother left them in. Daphne came into the living room with an infant son and sat on the sofa. Her grandmother told her um, that she was leaving the house. So the reason I'm repeating this, uh, going back into this, because now we're going to get down to the stick and potatoes of what really happened because this court document breaks, breaks it down all the way to the lowest common denominator, what attack took place. And this was the part that... Um, I wanted y'all as well as myself to become to be very aware of this so Brown went to the bathroom and was gone about five minutes when she returned from the bathroom she went to go give Daphne a hug and tell her they were leaving Daphne was still sitting on the couch nursing her baby when Brown was hugging Daphne Williams heard a pop pop she saw blood on Daphne's chest, jumped up, and started screaming. Williams picked up the baby who had fallen to the floor. She saw a brown sprinkle of flammable liquid, which she thought was nail polish remover, from a container in her pocket. Then Brown threw something and it caught on fire. The two girls were crying and left the house with Brown carrying the baby. So, it's been confirmed uh, they actually used a gun. So that's what happened. Um, that's how they unalived um, Daphne. So Brown and Williams walked to the bus stop and took a bus to Oceanetta's home. Oceanetta's family members commented, oh, you had the baby? Apparently believing it was Brown's. The girls went to Williams' bedroom and cried. Williams saw Brown take a small revolver from her coat pocket. About an hour later, Dolores drove Brown and the baby home. Brown took the gun with her. Dolores asked Brown who baby it was. Brown told her mother, because Dolores is Latasha Brown's mother, and um, she said a friend of hers asked her to keep the baby. And Dolores told Brown she said to take the baby back where she got it from. Okay, so it is being confirmed that initially Dolores did want her to take the baby back. Dolores left for work about 11 p.m. When she returned from work, Brown and the infant was gone. She did not know where they were until three or four months later. May 1996, Brown arrived in Texas with an infant. She stayed at the home of her grandmother. Then she and the baby moved in with her aunt, Evelyn Smith. Brown told Smith that she had a baby and her mother had put her out. Okay, all right, so this part I wasn't aware of, but let's continue. And she didn't have anywhere else to go, so that was the lie she basically told her aunt. Um that um her her mother put out so she told the aunt and the grandmother she didn't have the will to go with the baby brown was calling the baby shay smith the nurse helped brown obtain a birth certificate for the baby brown told her she did not have a certificate because she did not give birth in the hospital brown called williams a few days after she arrived in texas and williams took a bus to visit her there williams left after brown's grandmother said i was drinking up all her alcohol in October 96, Brown called her mother from Texas. Dolores went to Texas where Brown was staying with um, Smith, which was her aunt, um, Dolores' mother, I mean sister. Brown did not return to Vallejo with her mother. She eventually returned to January February 97, and she and the infant lived back with her mother. Her mother did not question Brown about why she had the baby because Brown was not a stable person. And she was very private. So, um, basically, the mama didn't want no sugar, honey, iced tea. She knew her daughter was determined in keeping this baby, which she knew was not hers. But um, the daughter probably wasn't wired all the way properly upstairs. And the mother knew it. And I guess she just went along to get along with it, even though she knew it was dead wrong. 
In the evening of May 17, 96, a neighbor of the Borden saw two African girls leaving the Borden's house. Though he did not see a baby, he then noticed smoke coming from the house and began spraying the house with water from with the garden hose. Vallejo uh, Fire Captain Catherine Dunn responded to the fire at the Borden home. Several neighbors told her there might be an infant inside, so um, they entered the house. They found Daphne's body. She was determined, unalive. Um, she and the other members of the fire investigation team searched for the infant, but the infant was nowhere to be found. Vallejo police was assigned to investigate the fire. He found evidence that the fire start, started around a sofa in the living room. Sergeant Mackin Madsen cough found no flammable liquids. Um, the only cause of the fire he could determine was arson. He testified that the ignition source, such as the match, may be completely consumed in the fire. And it is sometimes impossible to recover the traces of accelerant. So they really could not find much of anything. Um, but when they did perform an autopsy on Daphne's body, he identified based on, he was able to identify her based on her, uh, dental work, her dental records, because her body was just way too deformed, of course, because of the, of the fire. So he was able to recover two bullet projectiles from inside her skull and one from her spine. He testified that any one of the gunshot wounds would have been fatal. Because there was no smoke in her lungs or larynx. Um, he further determined she was already dead at the time of the fire. Which I, in that case, I would consider a blessing. Because she definitely would have suffered. Had she um, still been living with bullet wounds and having to be burnt alive. Vallejo Police Officer, um, Officer Horton arrested Brown December 6, 2002. While looking at her wallet for identification, he saw the minor kidnapped victim's identification prior to the advertising brown of her miranda rights he asked her where the minor was brown told him the minor was on the way to vegas with one of my friends police and fbi agent conducted a videotape interview of brown she claimed throughout the interview that she did not remember anything about daphne's murder or how she got the baby so basically she played crazy she stated that she did not remember until the point where i was on the bus to texas and i was looking down at the baby she stated that the child was hers, but admitted he did not come out of her body. <laughs> so y'all can only imagine how interesting this was. Um, the party stipulated that genetic testing on the minor excluded Brown and the child's mother. And indicated he was the biological father of Daphne Boyd and, and Lathan um, Williams. So Young Lay basically did a blood test and once that was conducted... And it was discovered that the child was his that excluded her, um, Brown, from being the mother. So, y'all, this was very interesting. Um, see if there's any other adequate information I need to give y'all out of here. So, at this point, um, it is just basically stating every, all of uh, Brown's statements to the police and how she tried to flip the script and tried to, you know, insinuate the police was coercing her to give more information than what she wanted to give, you know, based, straight up narcissist gaslighting. Um, further information, Brown, who desperately wanted to be a mother, had recently learned that she was mistaken about being pregnant. Medical professionals testified that despite Brown's claim she was not pregnant on April 27th, 1996, Williams testified um, about Brown's threat to kill Daphne, kidnap her baby, and burn down the house. So, you know, I don't want to regurgitate all of that because I didn't already mention that earlier. That's just repeating the same thing. Um, so, but yeah, well, I, I'll leave that um, there because there's a whole lot of inf a lot of other frivolous information. It's just extremely detailed. But we, uh, we pretty much get the basics um, of this whole situation. Basically, make it simple. Young Lay had a groupie who he had been smashing. And um, once the groupie, who was already dysfunctional, already had a lot of mental issues going on within herself, once she got word that Young Lay had impregnated this other woman, this other young lady, Daphne, and Daphne had that baby. In her mind, she felt like that baby had belonged to her. So she took matters upon herself. She thoroughly... Um, came up with this demonic plan where her cousin, 
who was right in on it with her. And she made the ultimate decision to unalive this woman so she can take this uh, this woman's baby and raise her as her own. And the crazy part, like I said, even though she left and went to stay um, with family somewhere else for a while, she came back and was living in, in Vallejo, California, right around the corner for six years raising that baby. How her conscience couldn't stand it, how her conscience could live with it, knowing every time you look at that child how, how that baby got here and to know it's your fault why the mother's not here this is the psyche of some of these side chicks they, they're they're just that delusional they're just that delusional they're just that dysfunctional and they have no remorse none whatsoever now to understand her psyche, I am going to read the letter she called herself writing to God in prison. So we can really uh, get a mental in-depth of her mental abilities and how she reasoned with things. God, right now my life is pretty much worthless. I'm sorry that this happened. I think about all of the beautiful people in my life that I'm going to miss. I think about how sad everybody is on how her poor grandmother felt. Nobody really cares what happens to me, and neither do I. I'm truly sorry that this happened. No words can change what was done, but look how many years were changed by this. Everybody thinks I'm cold and heartless, but only you really know me, and all I wanted was to be a mommy, and now I never will. Nope. I can imagine how they will beat me in prison and slander my family's name. I know that what happened can't be undone. So now I have to find a way to take full blame so everybody can live happy lives. I tried to say I was alone, but the truth about Oceanetta being there came out. What do I do? I need your mercy. Lord, God, for the rest of my life, I will be away from Shay. I don't know why she named him Shay because he's a boy. But again, we're dealing with somebody who is dysfunctional. I know he will never forgive me and hate me. I never wanted that boy to suffer. I pray that I at least one chance to hug him. I'm sorry, Lord. Now where do we go from here? I wish I could just wake up and it would all just go away, but it won't. My head hurts, my body is tired, and I just want to rest. I have never had joy besides shade, and now I never will. I'm tired of talking, my stomach is aching. I know this is the end for me. Just be with me. So as you notice, she said absolutely nothing about that child's mother who she abducted. So she's definitely not one to reason with accountability. Anytime you're dealing with a person who does not, uh, um, um, who does not take accountability, you're automatically at a loss. So she ended up getting 25, to, 25 years to life for Daphne murders. Brown was convicted of first degree murder based on the felony murder doctrine. She argues, uh, what well, that was the section 654, um, consecutive sentence for the kidnapping because it was the underlying felony relied on by the prosecution to, to convict her her first degree murder so this was uh, even though um, this is every bit of several years ago this story is very haunting it's very haunting um, simply because of what all had occurred It was very haunting. So I might as well say almost 30 years ago, 28, almost 30 years ago when this happened. Now, I did do some um, up-to-date research. I will say this much. Um, Reva Lee, the grandmother of Daphne, who passed, she too passed in 2011. So Mrs. Boyden is with her granddaughter once again um because she passed as well 
So may God bless their two souls. Um, young Lay's son, Lejean Williams, is every bit of 26 or 27 years old. Um, well, yeah, might as well say um, he's almost 30 because this happened 30 years ago. He's almost 30. Um, and, of course, he in, he was given back to um, Young Lay's and Young Lay's family once he was returned at the age of six years old. But um, you can only imagine how confusing it was for him being six years old, the, the woman who's been raising you, feeding you, taking care of you. And that's the crazy part. Uh, Brown was actually taking care of him. He was not being abused. He was not being molested or any of that. He was well taken care of. She brought him nice clothes. He went to school. She fed him. He was not neglected or abused. But that's besides the point. She murdered his mother. Now, I know now he's well, well aware of how he got here. I could only imagine those mixed feelings because the woman did not abuse him. She, did, she wasn't mean to him. She wanted so badly to be a mother, so she really mothered him. But the problem was that was not her child. She killed that child's mother. So I won't be surprised if he somewhat resents her. Not being almost a grown man, knowing the details. But I won't be surprised if because his biological mother is gone, he still doesn't want to have a bond with the woman who raised him and unalived his mother. We've seen situations like this happen where uh, young people get, where, where, where children get taken away from their biological parents. Only be to be raised by the people who ruined their parents' lives and their lives by snatching them, stealing them away, and raising them. Now this child is grown and knows better, but this is the problem. This child has bonded with this family. This child's bond, and we heard several stories about it. I forgot about the young lady who um who was abducted and um and raised. By her kidnapper. Yeah, Kamaya Mobley. Yeah. Um, this happened in 98. She was abducted from the Florida hospital. And um, she was only eight years old. And that story became a disaster. You know, by the time she was old enough to get to learn about her biological parents. They could not click. They could not bond because this woman had this 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 young lady had been raised by her abductor. The lady posed as a nurse and stole her child. Went so far as to um, enter in the hospital dressing up as a nurse. That's how desperate she wanted to be a child. You got some evil women out here. Who are very relentless. Who will stop at nothing to get what she want. When she did. Uh, reconnect with her family. Her and her biological mother couldn't get along. She. She had. Um, she had bonded with her kidnapper. That's who had been basically raising her the majority of her life. Now, the mother ended up being sentenced to 18 years in prison for kidnapping her. And ironically, you know, um, Kamaya still refers to her kidnapper as her mother. And she still communicates with her while she's in prison. She cannot stand her own biological mother. I remember they went on one of those shows. I, I don't know if it was Ayanla. And Ayanla could not get Kamaya and her mother. No one on the same page. It was like her daughter came back into her life as a stranger. So the emotional toll it takes on children who end up getting caught in this is, is very, very detrimental. But again, young lay was out there wilding. Young lay allegedly was laying this woman. And in her mind, because she wanted to be pregnant so bad, she made herself believe she was going to have a baby. That she was going to be a mother. Um, and 
I can only imagine how painful it is um, as a woman where you're not able to have a child, to produce a child. Um, as much as it's an uncomfortable, untouch, it's an uncomfortable subject. It's not a pleasant subject to talk about. It's very touchy. And um, women who have struggled conceiving, um, if they don't accept their situation, they will take matters into their own hands and really bring havoc upon themselves and havoc around other people. Um, Brown was determined she was going to be a mother. And if it wasn't going to be Daphne, it was going to be somebody else. The unfortunate part was, again... Um, young Lay was an upcoming rapper. He was hot at the time. And he basically linked up with the wrong woman. Who already had dysfunctional issues. And wanted a child of her own. And the fact that she couldn't have a child from him. Um, she took all of that anger and hostility out on Daphne. And unalived her and took Daphne's child. And the family had to suffer and live with that. And I, I, as old as the story is, y'all, I don't know why, but I, I have a tendency to remember the most meaningless things. I remember when they came on Oprah. I don't know if it was Donnie Hugh or one of them shows. But I very well remember uh, when uh, they was invited on a talk show. And Daphne's family was there. And... Um, Natasha Brown's family was there. You know, the ones who didn't have any direct involvement, but was well aware of the case. And I remember, as my if my memory serves me correctly, um, Natasha Brown's family was saying, it's not right that y'all took the son, took Lejean from us, even though, yeah, it was wrong that he was kidnapped from Daphne, but this is the thing, he's bonded with us We've been raising them all of these years. So that child should still be a part of this family. And that is when Daphne family, I don't know if it was a sister or the aunt, which told her right, righteously so. She said, first of all, if it wasn't for Daphne, Lejean wouldn't even been in y'all family for um, Latasha to steal. In other words, it boils down to, I don't care how y'all slice it, how y'all dice it. Daphne is the mother of this child. Y'all cannot make it make sense that we should allow this child to still bond with y'all. It was never her baby to begin with. So it's been years of a battle. I, I would have loved to talk with one of them now to really find out where everything, where are they mentally with this, emotionally with this. Have things gotten better? Have things gotten worse? I definitely would love to speak to someone um, who's affiliated with this family. Hell, I would love to speak with Young Lady Rapper and uh, just really see how he's doing. Oh, because also, let me tell y'all that too. Young Lady's life continued to spiral and go out of control because, you know, after that kidnapping and the death of losing his child's mother, uh, Young Lady was sentenced to a 12 year sentence, prison sentence in 1999 after armed robbery. So, even though he has been released from prison since 2010, look like he's doing good, he looks healthy. Um, actually, he's quite handsome, you know. Um, he looks like he, you know, still has survived and has not allowed the situation um, to get the best of him. But yes, he completely derailed after that. Um, I guess after the loss, especially after the loss of his child's mother, um, and also his success declining. I think at this point he just really felt like he didn't have nothing to live for or, or to go on about. You know, um, I'm not sure what his mental psyche was at that point in time, but he completely had derailed. Um, and he did 12 years while, I guess, while his family had to raise um, Lejean. So, um, nevertheless, he's doing well. He's been released since 2010, like I said. So, um, this story has a lot of twists and turns. This definitely should have been a movie. It definitely should have been a movie because it was just very interesting how all the details unfold. But it just brought down to more of the story. Men, be very careful with women that you lay up with. You never know their mind. 
the mindset you never know um what type of mental conditions they are under young lady was dealing with a female who really wanted a baby and she didn't care at what means how far she would have to go to make it happen and it resulted in him losing the mother of his child and several years of him being able to father his, his son so it was a very unfortunate situation very tragic like i said it's very old but it's very painful i could only imagine um the years of agony and what both families had gone through but um, sounds like to me nobody was not going to be able to tell Natasha Brown much of anything she made her mind up that was her baby um, I'm sure a lot of people knew it was wrong but everybody knew Latasha Brown was crazy and um, nobody better not say nothing to her nobody better not confront her about it I think everybody just knew Latasha Brown was off the chain and had them had they corrected her and said anything to her she was going to go ham she wanted a baby badly did all that to end up in prison and still not be the mother that you had dreamed to be. Because that little boy ended up going right back to his family. So she should have really thought that through. She could have adopted a child. She was only 15. She had plenty of time. She probably would have had children by then. That's why I tell my daughter, I try to, you know, you got young women out here. Tell them how to deal with their emotions before they end up doing time in prison as grown women. Because we've all been there. You know, I've done some things that could have made me prison potential material. And that's why it's very important because a lot of us who have dodged a bullet through God's grace and mercy, we need to put these young people on. I don't know what it was about this young lady who wanted a baby at the age of 15 years old. Um, also, I did have somebody reach out to me about the Carly Hughes because I did say I was going to write her. Um, she's been since then relocated, removed from the prison um, where she was. I think they turned that prison into a, all um, the prison she was in in North Carolina. It's a different type of prison now. I think it's for juveniles. Yeah, I think it's for juveniles now. So she's been relocated, but I'm going to continue to keep doing my research to see when I, I, I can find, locate which prison she's at so I can write her and try to get more insight on what made her unalive um her uh, engaged boyfriend's fiance at the time you know who was pregnant so um i haven't forgotten about that i, I just don't have the information i need she's relocated prisons from the last time i was going to try to write her so i gotta continue to keep doing my research but yes, y'all, this has been a very interesting story. Y'all stay prayed up, even though this is old news. Things like that still happen to this day. And that's why I said it is not worth getting involved with men um, who are in a relationship. Even if they're not married, you just don't take a chance and get involved with men um, who are in relationships and you just got to be careful you got to keep yourself emotionally together getting attached to these men um who are already committed to somebody or in many cases don't want to commit to nobody you have to be careful with that but anyway leave your opinion below let me know what y'all think about this story i got much much more content that is old that i have to upload so nevertheless y'all it is your girl your diva and knowledge lady mocha represent mocha's ladies lounge y'all be blessed and i will be talking with y'all soon bye Thank <laughs> you.